we've got a very eclectic group of community activists and um, and scholars, and you know, we're just really well rounded here today. So um, I am going to begin with a quote because I'm a sociologist, and I I, uh, I begin with quotes. And this particular quote is uh, is um, from Audre Lord, and uh, and I think even though she she wrote it um, in in uh, what is called her Cancer Diaries. Uh, she, uh, she is, uh, this particular quote, really to me when I read it, it really spoke to what is going on in our communities today. And I, I just could not help um, picturing George Floyd and others, uh, and we know those names all too well, don't we? Uh, so I, uh, I, I just want to read this very quick quote from someone I, who I think was a warrior woman. She says, I want to write, um, I want to write rage. I want to write rage, but all that comes is sadness. We've been sad uh, long enough to make this earth either weep or grow fertile. I'm an anachronism, a sport, like the bee that was never meant to fly. Science said so. I am not supposed to exist. I carry death around in my body like a condemnation, but I do live. The bee flies. There must be some way to integrate death into living, neither ignoring it nor giving into it. Um, and I, this is one of the first times I've read that quote without crying. So you all should congratulate me for, for, uh, for doing that. Uh, so without, you, the way the the way our program is going to go today is um, is that I'm going to tell you who the panelists are, and then each one in order will will give a few remarks of about seven or eight minutes, and we'll write uh, questions in the chat box, and uh, and our our. Um, uh, our panelists will be able to talk to each other and perhaps answer your questions. So uh, these are our panelists. Uh, we have um, Pastor Julian Lowe, uh, who is from LA. And uh, we have Mark Robinson, who is a history professor uh, in, at Cal State San Bernardino. We have, and we're very honored to have Hattie McNutt, who is in CSUSB counseling. And, and um, by the way, Mark is gonna give a obviously a historical perspective and then some contemporary observations. Hattie will talk about uh, uh, the trauma of what all of us are going through today, but most especially those people who are, who are close to the families of the, the victims of, um, of the brutality that we've been seeing in our communities for so long. Uh, and then we have Sid Crudup, uh, who is, congratulations, Sid, you are a newly minted PhD, uh, and Sid is an author and educator, and he's going to give us some, uh, some, uh, re uh, give us some remarks on um, officer attitude and, and connecting, how does one connect with the community if one is a police officer in the community. There's no one on this panel, I don't think, who believes that policing should be uh, eliminated, but we know we know that we can have a better way to police our communities. Uh, then we have uh, Lita Heron, who is an activist in LA, and she's going to uh, engage us with her experiences. Uh, and then we have two students, two Cal State San Bernardino students, uh, Cameron Pyant and Marlo Brooks. And then, of course, because we need some stability in our lives, you have a sociology professor, and that would be me, <laughs> uh, to, put, to bring the, all these historians and counselors in line. And then um, two people who we will not see much, but Jeremy Murray is a professor of history, and Jeremy took care of pretty much all of the logistics of, of, of getting us all together, setting, it, setting the... Um, Zoom up. So we're very, very grateful for Jeremy for uh, to Jeremy for for doing that. Uh, Char uh, Charlene Eaton, we call her Charlie around here, but uh, Charlie is um, is an adjunct professor working toward her PhD, and uh, she's got some students who are who are listening in and and uh, going to be engaging with us. 
And then finally, we have an ASL interpreter by the name of Rory Burton. So without uh, any more delay, let's go to Mark. Mark Robinson, oh, excuse me, uh, Pastor Lowe, are you there? Is Pastor Lowe there? I guess not. I guess uh, we uh, we haven't. Uh, he, he hasn't. He hasn't come he, yet. He is here, uh, Mary, but he must be muted. Must so, be Pastor muted. Lowe, if you can hear me, uh, if you can hit your unmute button, he's here because we are communicating. Okay. I just okay. unmuted him. Uh, there oh, you go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, no. No. Sorry. No. no. Pastor Pastor Lowe, are you there? Now I just did. Yes, I am here. There he Hi, is. Hi, how are you? You know, I, we, we hate to lay this on you like this, but you're going to be the first on this panel. And, <laughs> wow. And, and you, you're going to have between seven and eight minutes to say anything you want to say in regard to the topic of our discussion today, which is, of course, the, all of the events that are going on in our communities. Uh, so take it away, Pastor Lowe. Um, yes, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It is a privilege and an honor, um, also a joy, because it, it may not be known on this call, but I pastor a church in LA, but I was born and raised in San Bernardino, California, and, and went to Eisenhower in Rialto. Matter of fact, my apartment was on college and university, and I used to walk to Cal State San Bernardino all the time, and so oh. I'm a San Bernardino Rialto native. Um, um, I bet that's been transplanted to LA and um, I, I think for what we are talking about today where we are talking about all the things that are happening in our nation um, I, I think what I've been experiencing just in the in the role that I am is something called compounded pain where you you don't actually have an opportunity to recover from your last painful experience before another one hits that's what makes this particular season so dangerous to the, to the human mind and the human soul um, and, and to the psyche and, and spirituality is because we haven't had a chance to recover from the last thing. So I was pastoring a service and sharing the word and I found out in the middle of the service that Kobe Bryant had passed away, a hero to many people, but oh, honestly, people of, 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 of color in our community, that was, their hero. Some people would tell me I didn't have a dad, so I didn't have a father who was a hero and Kobe Bryant was my hero. And I spent a month crying with people in our, our community. And, and then right after around that month, around February, I started buying a couple of bottles of, of hand sanitizer because I'd heard that this virus from, from China had, had landed in America, in Seattle. A month after that, our churches would be closed. And we'd be raising funds to help those affected by COVID-19. And, and I passed in my church, so I have a team who does that. And we, we were able to send out $100,000 in two months to communities affected by COVID-19. And because I'm a pastor, I'm supposed to pray. I asked for a list of those families that had been, that had had the money sent to them because they didn't have food and they, and they couldn't pay their rent. And I was brokenhearted to discover that 95% of the families we sent money to were people of color. Mm -hmm. And I had called people who were not of color in my church and hear what I'm saying. And I only found one that actually needed any help at all. They were good, they were able to work remotely. And most of the people that I had called that needed help during that time. That, that may not be the narrative, San Bernardino, you may know all different types of, of colors that have lost their, their jobs, but, but COVID-19 deeply affected the, the, the African-American community specifically, as well as the Hispanic community. Um, there are stats that have come out that 68% of the South side of Chicago coronavirus deaths were black people. And so then you had Kobe, a hero of our community, and then you had COVID-19. And in the middle of that, now you have uh, what really is a, an uprising of, of, of racism in, in our country and it's caused violence and, it, and it's caused pain. Here's what I would like to share from my perspective, is that my favorite uh, activist of all time is Martin Luther King. And, and what I'm growing increasingly concerned about is that we, we see quotes from Martin Luther King, 
We, we see what he said. We see what he did. But we forget the source of how he did that. Uh, Martin Luther King's last public words to the public were, I'm not fearing any man, for, for my eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. Now, this is not to push spirituality on anyone. But what I believe that we need to do is he said that God had taken him to this mountaintop and he had seen a future where the sons on the red hills of Georgia, he said, the sons of slave owners and the, and the sons of slaves would sit at the table of brotherhood. Why was Martin Luther King able to fight in such a passionate way? Because he had seen so much of what the future could be. And my concern about racism is racism is a product of, 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 of racists being blind. But I wanna challenge everyone, racism also blinds the oppressed. It makes you be unable to see that there is a hope. It makes you be unable to see that you will rise from it. It actually isn't just the racist that is blind or the oppressor that is blind. It is the oppressed that becomes blind as well. And I remember one of the Martin Luther King's greatest challenges is he was unable to bring other black activists together because they were blinded by rage. Mm -hmm. and, and here's what I'm saying. Am I outraged? Yes. Am I angry? Yes. But I believe that our rage can be blinding and we can't see change. We can't see a future. We also can't see the next step. The reality is, is that our country is in pain and, and we have all types of things to avoid pain. Matter of fact, if you Googled different types of medicines that can make sure you're not in pain, you know, even you can take this pill and it'll do that. You can take this pill and do that. Oh, you don't need to like work out. Just put a back patch, you know, if you have back pain. When really, if you strengthen your core, it would help with your back. But no, 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 you don't need to do that. We'll just give you some med. We are, we, are a, we are a country that is obsessed with medicine. The reality is, in order to heal racism, there will have to be rehabilitation. And we have to learn that we need to be better stewards of pain. Here's what I will say. My father got knee replacement surgery a couple of years ago. And the doctor said, three days after you get knee replacement surgery, Mr. Lowe, we will have to bend your knee at a 90 degree angle. So my father says he lays on the table, the doctor bends his knee, and my dad shouts in pain. He said, Julian, I am 65 years old, and I have never been in this much pain in my life. I screamed in pain, and I asked the doctor, how far was it? And the doctor told me 70 degrees. Mm. And I, I was so discouraged because I was in that much pain and I realized we have so far to go. I, as Americans and as, as, as even black people or white people, we can be in so much pain and become discouraged because we have so far to go. And my dad said, I wanted to quit. And he said, but here's why I did it. Because the doctor told me that if I quit and I don't do this, I will have scar tissue that will build up in my knee and I won't be in pain but I will limp for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to limp. Mm -hmm. And he said, so he asked the doctor to bend it again. And my dad said, this time I almost blacked out. It was so painful and tears were streaming down. I'm 65 and I'm weeping. I'm in so much pain. And I asked the doctor, how far was it? And the doctor said 75 degrees. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, I wanted to quit. And I honestly believe that because of our obsession with medication, and not our obsession with healing when we get to that place of pain as a nation we quit and we just move on the story ends with my dad's knee that the doctor had to put him asleep he was in so much pain and and, and then while he, my dad was asleep the doctor bent his knee to 90 degrees mm -hmm. we do not have the luxury to be asleep not one more day and there are certain things that your education and your knowledge and your research will wake you up. But there are certain things that I strongly believe that only God can wake up. And I, until we get back to Martin Luther King's source, I don't know that we will see the change that Martin Luther King saw. And so my encouragement to all of us is in your own way to explore 
um, the source of your faith that would have you work at such a challenging thing, but with faith in your heart that you will see change. Uh, thank you for letting me share. I'm so honored. Thank you, Pastor Lowe. Those were uh, uh, the perfect, perfect words to start our discussion today. And we're certainly going to come back and, and uh, hope, hopefully you can join into the discussion uh, once all of the panelists uh, have presented uh, their, um, uh, their remarks. Um, so next we have Professor Mark Robinson, who is um, uh, in the CSUSB Department of History. And Mark is gonna give us some historical perspective. He's a historian after all. And uh, he's also going to take us up into contemporary times and, and, um, and, and give some remarks about that. So, Mark? Mary, can I ask that yes. you uh, take your screen uh, share you. off? Um, yeah. Um, yes, thank you to all of you. For... OK. Uh, thank you for all of you for uh, being here in the audience, and then as well, um, Many thanks to my co-panelists and everyone who organized this event today. Uh, so I want to make a couple points um, and offer some observations, uh, beginning with thinking about the larger context that we're living in, right? So thinking as a soci sociological lens, maybe Dr. Teixeira can help me out on this. Um, if we think about the recent killing of Breonna Taylor and uh, George Floyd and so many others, of course, we're thinking about the criminal justice system and the ways in which at really every step along that journey from who gets stopped to who gets seen with suspicion, to who gets charged, who gets convicted, and then what are those sentencing and you know, on through the system, uh, we see disproportionately harsh sentences, uh, disproportionate negative outcomes for African Americans, right? That larger social, that social context is important to keep in mind as we think about what's happening right now around the protests uh, and issues of social inequality. And then of course, we broaden that out to think about a variety of issues from uh, housing to uh, employment to issues of education uh, to even how the COVID-19 pandemic, as was mentioned earlier, has had a disproportionate impact on African Americans, right? All of those things, uh, all those different aspects of society are part of the context that we all, uh, it's important for us to keep in mind as we think about what's happening in this current moment. My second point is thinking about his history. Um, of course, the history of the United States is riddled with all kinds of tragic stories starting with the indigenous peoples of this land uh, and continuing with the exploitation of, of slavery and uh, the exploitation of all kinds of working peoples and you know, various ec ecological disasters and, and so forth. But particularly as we think about modern policing, and when I say modern, I'm thinking about really after the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, there's a way in which that history of modern policing uh, is itself intertwined with the history of demonization and marginalization and criminalization of African Americans, right? And so one example of that is the history of convict leasing. Uh, convict leasing was a system that really grew after slavery ended, right? Uh, at a moment where there needed to be a new system of justifying the ongoing racial oppression uh, that existed at that time, right? During slavery, it doesn't really make sense to criminalize African Americans because uh, they functioned, you know, African Americans primarily functioned as servants and slaves. Um, but after slavery is over, there becomes this new need to justify. And so this criminalization becomes an important ideological structure. And then as a, as a, as a tandem development, you had the growth of the system of uh, heavy law enforcement, uh, criminalization of all kinds of nonviolent uh, offenses, things that really aren't crimes, um, you know, things like vagrancy at the time, you know, was a huge one, or, or you potentially get arrested or basically just hanging out or going fishing or, or, or you know, you know do going about your day-to-day -day life. But if you weren't working for, you know, a white person, you could be picked up. And so 
know, it became a way of criminalizing all kinds of uh, black life, just you know, going about their regular day-to-day -day activities. Um, that then led to increasing amounts of prison populations, and that then became this convict leasing system where uh, incarcerated individuals, oftentimes young black men, were rented out or leased uh, to do various agricultural work, uh, manufacturing, uh, construction, and so forth. Um, there's a great documentary about this called, uh, um, it's called- 13th? I have it written down here. Um, Not 13th. Slavery by Another Name. Uh, Slavery by Another Name is the name of oh, both the documentary okay. and the mm -hmm. book. Uh, mm -hmm. great, great resource um, to check out. Um, for more information. So um, again, right, this documentary of slavery by another name and this history of convict leasing is all about how uh, our leasing system is itself intertwined with this fairly recent, from a historical perspective, post-Civil post War uh, demonization and uh, criminalization of African-American and, and Black life. Moving on to my next uh, and again, uh, if, if we want to come back to any of these topics, uh, I'm definitely happy to do so during the Q&A later. Uh, moving to my next point, uh, I imagine many of us are familiar with the, the topics that I'm mentioning, both contemporary and historical, structural, uh, and institutional inequalities, and are wondering what we can do about it. So let me say a little bit about that. Uh, in, in terms of what we can do, of course, there's a variety of things. You know, voting, of course, is a major one. Uh, becoming informed, becoming educated, participating in dialogues like this are an important step. Uh, let me add another one that I think I can see in my own research. Uh, I'm currently working on a book that's about uh, college black students who were activists in the late 60s and who organized to push for reform. And one thing that I pull from that history is how uh, these college students were able to build connections and relationships and alliances with a broad swath of community members, right? So high school students, parents, community members, uh, grassroots organizers, church leaders, uh, any kind of um, civic leaders who, who may have been prominent who were out and willing to allies, uh, as well as uh, white allies and other people of color who weren't black but who are willing to cooperate or willing to have a shared vision, right? Uh, building that kind of set of relationships, alliances, coalitions, um, what we can call building a base of support, uh, that's an important piece that I see in my research that's oftentimes um, not talked about so much today, at least I find. Uh, and so, for example, we'll look at the Montgomery boycott and we'll see that there was this mobilization, but we don't oftentimes think about what happened before Rosa Parks was arrested in 55. Um, what happened before then was many years of this building a base, right? People who were organized, people who were building relationships, people who were uh, coming together and, and creating a shared vision uh, for several years before 1955. Uh, I think that's something that we can sort of think about, how can we begin uh, to do that? How can we continue to do that? Uh, and for, for many um, activists today, or people who are looking to get active, I think about that as a strategy that you can then put pressure on elected officials, on various institutions where if you can have parents and college students and faith leaders and civic leaders all putting pressure together collectively uh, that can be quite effective. I, I see that as being quite effective in my research, and I think it can continue to be effective uh, going forward. And let me end with this. Black lives matter. That, that needs to be said over and over because in so many ways, uh, we, both African Americans and all Americans, are given this message that black lives do not matter. That was, among many things, the tragic message of the video of George Floyd's killing. The message was that this life doesn't matter. This black man is worthless. And of course, that's all garbage. So I want to end with emphasizing everyone who's listening for all of 
the African American folks in the audience, on the panel, um, your life matters, our lives matter, Black lives matter. We deserve respect, we deserve rights, we deserve uh, freedom and justice. Black lives matter, thank you. Boy, with that, we can all go home. Mark, you've <laughs> just, uh... You've just captured it all. Thank you so much. You know, and I, I know I'm breaking protocol here, but I, I've always wanted to ask a historian um, a question that many of my students ask me, you know, why can't we leave that stuff in the past? Why do we have to, why do we have to bring up slavery? Why do we have to bring up the slave patrols and the, you know, and I know you've heard that too, um, probably in, you know, different ways, but I, I just need to hear from a professional historian because I try to muddle my way through it, but what do you think? What, what's, what's, what's a good answer the next time somebody asks us that? Did, did I put well, you on the as spot? a historian, I think <laughs> the, the, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but um, I, I think as a historian, the first thing that comes to my mind is that if we think in, a, in the long term, um, we can think about how uh, social dynamics develop over a swath of years. Um, and so, right, if we think about from, you know, 1619 when, you know, the first recorded slaves arrived to, you know, 1965 when we have perhaps the beginning of a multiracial democracy, um, that's 350 years where this whole system was being put in place, right? And so, if we think about that 350 year chunk as one kind of era in time, well, of course, we're still living through another era that's going to be playing out or going to be uh, dismantled or constructed over a number of years. And so um, for any of my colleagues who study, you know, you know, Chinese history or, you know, Greek and Roman history and so forth, European history, you know, they think in terms of hundreds of years, yeah. even thousands of years as a particular era. We in America, we're still sort of new to the game that we think, you know, in a decade or so, you know, we expect to see some, some major shift. And, and, and sadly, uh, well, for better or for worse, um, we, if we think more historically, we'll say, well, of course, we're still living during the aftermath of slavery. We're, mm -hmm. we're still sort of figuring out as a nation going to be um, now that we've had the civil rights movement, you know, we're, we're still very much in the throes of that. So, so of course we have to continue to look, look back to, you know, what happened a hundred years ago because we're still living in that moment in a sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Good answer. Good answer, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, our next panel, and thank you for letting me put you on the spot like that. I, I apologize, but not very much. Uh, our next panelist no is, uh, is, is someone that we're so happy to have uh, on the panel, and she's fairly new to campus. Um, uh, her name is Hattie McNutt, and Hattie is a counselor, and she is going to talk about trauma, and, uh, and we can't wait to hear from her. Hattie? Thank you. Um, I am very happy and excited to be here, um, a part of this discussion. Um, I want to uh, focus on trauma, the psychological. I am a marriage and family therapist here at um, the campus, and I work for CAPS, uh, Counseling and Psychological Services. And I'm going to come from two different perspectives, one a little bit more uh, personal, and then one from um, uh, the trauma base. And I actually had changed this up a little bit because I recently had uh, some very interesting conversations with some of my friends, especially my um, Caucasian friends. And they asked me, what is Black people so upset about? What are they really so upset about? And why? Why can't they get over it and move on? And it was a very powerful conversation in that um, I was unaware that when they had that question in them or didn't have that understanding. Um, and then I started to ask that self in myself. And then I started to reflect on my experiences as a Black person, as a Black woman. Um, and I started to reflect on my, my own personal 
two encounters uh, with law enforcement and how absolutely terrifying and upset upsetting they were and what came of them for me and how it changed and impacted my life and my experiences of how I see things and, um, and present myself. So I want to talk about trauma, uh, especially from the psychological perspective. When, when we think about trauma, we understand it to be a deeply distressing and disturbing experience. It is common to experience shock and denial. And I remember when I first saw the video of Mr. Floyd and it was my husband that brought it to me and I, I watched it and I said to him, please tell me that this isn't real, that this isn't happening again. And what struck me was the fact that I so quickly said, again, uh, a continuation of this. And I saw a person can have a range of emotions uh, and reactions, but it is common to experience feelings of extreme anxiety and anger and sadness. And I felt all of those things in that moment. Some will experience uh, a sense of helplessness and vulnerability. And I remember that experience. And I can't get those images out of my head. So I continue to go, it's the flashback of those memories and my experiences and experiences that I am aware of and that I know and that I see. So, from those symptoms, because I'm, I'm kind of thinking in a psychological perspective, I'm always thinking from the mental health perspective, how can I help myself? How can I help um, people around me to better understand and to cope with what they're feeling and what they're going through? But when those symptoms are persistent and causes disruption in your daily functioning, you're likely suffering from what we call as uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. PTSD. And I try to help them to understand what post-traumatic stress syndrome is um, as a disorder uh, from the mental health perspective. Being a condition that develops in response to an ex experiencing or witnessing an extreme distress, it, stressful event that threatens a threat of death or extreme bodily harm. And it was important for me to characterize what that really means because these are vivid, intrusive memories of this precipitating event that you can experience. And I said, event, I said, understand that. These are some of the things that you can go through. And more than likely, at least over half of our population will experience some type of trauma uh, in their lifetime. And they're able to go on and function um, to some degree of normalcy in their life. But then there are those that are going to experience um, much harsher um, symptoms like uh, nightmares and mood disturbance. Um, they feel anxious and scared. Even in the absence of fear or harm or danger, they still feel scared. You become hypervigilant. You can experience emotional numbness, anger, and aggression. You can also experience panic, dread, and terror. So if one event can create this for a person, one event, can you imagine, and this is me talking to my friends, can you imagine what it must be like for a person or a people 
when those precipitating events are continuously constant and ongoing. To have to endure all of those symptoms, sometimes on a daily basis, when they are reminded over and over of who they are and where they are and what they have to deal with in their lives. So I said to them, the use of deadly force by police against unarmed Black Americans carries with that the weight of an historical perspective. It's not just about what we're experiencing at this moment. It's about what we have been experiencing all of my life, my parents' life, my grandparents' life, my ancestors' life. It just doesn't go away. So to really understand the historical trauma, you have to understand what that truly means. And this is my definition. This is my research, a definition of understanding of historic trauma. Is an event or a set of events that happens to a group of people who share a specific identity and each individual event is profoundly traumatic. And when you look at all the events as a whole, they represent a history of sustained cultural disruption and community destruction. And that is what we endure. Black people have a legacy of intergenerational trauma and a an unrelenting cycle of violence and oppression. So when you think about that legacy and those various um, precipitating events that are continuous and ongoing, that type of trauma goes back all the way from slavery and is passed down generations. And those effects are lasting and present from here, from then until now, today. So in a community, in a person, in a people, when you're enduring all of that on a regular basis, um, that type of trauma, it creates a lot of feelings and emotions and uncertainties um, that you're trying to process and you're trying to work your way through. A um, lot of frustration, a lot of anger. It affects the person. It creates a sense of loss of identity, of knowing who you are, feeling, and impairs your, your level of self-esteem. Your, your, it impairs your level of self-worth. It impairs your... Um, level of confidence in who you are as a person. As a people who often experience chronic or multiple trauma, including historical trauma, you are likely to have profound health issues. Mm -hmm. It's not just about someone not taking care of themselves or not eating themselves. If you are not mentally well, if you are not taking care of your mental well-being, your mental health, it will create things. It will help impede things like high blood pressure and diabetes and, and heart attack. You will create a sense of, you have depression, you become depressed and have anxiety. These type of traumatic and stressful environmental conditions that Black people are continuously subjected to are causing devastating consequences. The police brutality and the racism is causing an enormous amount of damage in the mental health of Black people. And I think that that through all of the things that we are continuing to experience with the continuous deaths of uh, Black people, Black women, and uh, Black men and women, um, and, our, and our youth, 
and we see it all the time, we experience it all the time, it is re-traumatizing. I think that what we as a people and as a nation, that we are suffering and we are feeling profound pain and hurt. And as a people, I think that I know that I am, I'm tired and I'm fed up. And I have to find my own way of trying to figure out what is my role, what is my part in helping this process along so that I can make the difference that I need. Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself on a regular basis that um, I wanna be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Um, I don't want to continue feeling afraid. When I think about my experiences um, with law enforcement, they would have seemed like nothing to anybody else. And when one particular experience was for me being pulled over um, for a traffic violation. And see, the thing about it was I didn't know why the police officer was pulling me over at first because anytime I see a police officer um, for whatever, I get a little uneasy. I think we all do. And I think that when they pull you over and the lights are going and um, there's that kind of sick, what did I do kind of thing uh, in your mind. I think we all get that feeling. But my, the difference in my feeling was when I pulled over and I'm thinking, okay, I wasn't speeding, I wasn't, it's dark. Um, I was actually in Riverside on Van Buren. And as I sat there, it's what went through my mind that is very disturbing because I literally started to process in my head what I should not do. And I started asking my, what you don't do. Okay, don't make any subtle moves. Should I keep my hand on the steering wheel? Should I roll down the window or should I wait for him to come and ask me to roll down the window? And then I said, God, please, I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. And I rolled down the window when he got to the window. I made that decision and I rolled down the window. And he said to me, ma'am, are you aware that your taillight is out? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. I was, I'm not aware of that. And he said, well, your taillight is out, so I'm going to write you this fix-it ticket and you need to get that fixed. And I said, okay, I'll do that right away, sir. And he gave me the ticket and he said, have a nice day. Mm -hmm. And he walked back to his car mm -hmm. and I sat there and I could not get my hands from, to stop shaking. Mm -hmm. I just got pulled over, received a fix it ticket, legit but I could not get my hands from, to stop shaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I did after the police officer left, I called I, I, with my, my husband, a wonderful man, love him dearly. <clears throat> but I called my mother, I called my mother. She is the one who I wanted. And when I saw Mr. Floyd laying there and he called for his mother, it was me all over again. That trauma, that event just broke my heart because that's exactly who I called my mother. And that's why when I think about where we go from here, I had someone ask me today, when we, this fades away, when we stop marching, is this conversation going to be as important 
a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, as it is today. And it is my hope, it is my desire, and it is my commitment that yes, it will be, because I had to have someone to remind me that Hattie, your life matters. All Black people lives matter. Yes, all lives matter, but they need to matter at the same degree, the same level, the same value, the same important, the same worth. That's the difference. Ours doesn't mm -hmm. because somebody lost his life over 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody lost his life over single selling of cigarettes, mm -hmm. two for one mm -hmm. dollar. Yes. Hattie, uh, if, if I may, uh, thank you so much for those remarks. And please, if there was anything else you wanted to add, let's, let's do it in, in the uh, general discussion that we have later. But thank you very, very much. You and Absolutely. I talked the other day about the concept of weathering, uh, this idea that that trauma invades our bodies. And, and if you look at any charts in terms of life expectancy, African Americans are very, very low you know, we uh, African American men uh, don't have the same life expectancy as any other group of men in the United States, and that's because over I was just I was going to say lifetime, but it's actually over generations, as you so so eloquently um, pointed out. It's over generations that we have this wearing and tearing down of the spirit, of the body and the soul. And so, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for putting that in perspective for us. I really appreciate it. As as do we all. Um, next on our agenda is uh, Sid Crudup. Um, like I said, brand new PhD, but also uh, is going to give us uh, some remarks on policing in, uh, in his own personal experience as well as uh, in his research. So Sid, if you will. Yeah, thank you very much. I so appreciate you guys allowing me to be on the panel with you. And it's quite overwhelming being around all of these bright minds and and getting to talk about these issues that we're dealing with in our communities. It's just kind of two points I want to touch on when it comes to community policing. Uh, one is connectivity and the other is confrontation. Um, when police enter into whatever community they're entering in, when we talk about police and community policing, the idea is having a collaborative effort with the community. And it identifies problems of crime, and disorder and it involves the community in the search for solutions and that involves two things um, a police community partnership and also proactive problem solving so if you have an officer who's only around in the neighborhood just when someone calls him or if he's looking for a criminal or if he's looking for a crime he's not actually connecting with the community um, because you're there on duty instead of just riding into the neighborhood stepping out of the car asking the people in the community how they're doing, you know, how are the kids, what's going on in the neighborhood, and just making that face-to-face -face contact where it would be a lot easier for them to solve crimes and to deal with issues if they knew the people that they were policing. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have different officers who police different communities. So the second point is the confrontation where if an officer comes into a community looking to confront that's where we end up with situations like George Floyd. And in the um, confrontation part, police are supposed to be the mediators between the community and the legal system. But what they do, they have a virtual monopoly on what we call the legitimate use of force. And it's based on the British model and it's based on biased policing. Mm -hmm. um, the British model is the offender was always assumed to be guilty and trials were very rare. So in the case of George Floyd, if you looked at the footage, and if you looked at what was happening uh, with this officer, his body language, his demeanor, his face, his hands in the pocket, uh, this man was guilty over an alleged $20 forgery. And even to the point where he spent two and a half more minutes after George was unresponsive. So this attitude of the legitimate use of force is the offender is already guilty, um, regardless of whether a trial is held. And that's based on entering into a community with a biased mindset or an attitude. Now, when you talk about bias, it's a prejudice that inhibits or inhibits 
objectivity and can involve or evolve into hatred. So if you come into a community with the bias that who I'm policing are lower than I am, you already have your objectivity level drops down. You're not objective concerning your job. Secondly, bias policing does not use a universal criteria in applying the law. Um, the police have what is called discretion and depending on the situation, depending on the circumstance, police officer can use the discretion to either write a ticket like Hattie was talking about or either make an arrest or to confront the issue. So bias is a prejudice. It inhibits objectivity. It doesn't have a universal criteria in applying the law. And even though the law says that all people are equal under the law, that's true on paper. Mm -hmm. The question is, is it true in the mind of the sentinel? Is it true in the mind of the officer that's coming into that community? Is he equal to me under the law, even though the paperwork says it? Thirdly, biased policing has its roots in practices of fugitive slave laws, black codes, and Jim Crow. And I wanted to touch on a little bit what Dr. Robinson was talking about historically when you said, well, why can't people get rid of the slavery issue? Anyone who studies constitutional law, when you come to your 13th Amendment, you know that there is an exclusionary clause there. Hmm. And it reads, it reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except for punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted mm -hmm. shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. That is what I call the criminalization loophole. Going back to what Dr. Robinson was talking about, how we criminalize uh, vagrancy, how we criminalize walking on the street at night, that exceptionary clause shows me or shows anyone who studies constitutional law that slavery wasn't eradicated, it was just transferred. It was transferred from the plantation to the prisons mm -hmm. where you now have mass incarceration. So we over criminalize and use black people as a, a warehousing mechanism to take them and to store them in facilities for the acts to, to maintain the institution of slavery. We may not have the label, but we still have the impact. So slavery was not completed, completely eradicated, but it was cradled in the very amendment that was designed to free them. So you have prejudice, no criteria of applying the law, roots and practices, fugitive slave law, black codes, Jim Crow. And I just wanna read a quote from a study from a Swedish social economist that said this, probably no group of whites in America have a lower opinion of the Negro people and are more fixed in their views than Southern policemen. To most of them, no Negro woman knows what virtue is and practically every Negro man is a criminal. Mm. So there's always a bias there when it comes to policing. On the flip side of that, there's also a bias with us in the community when it comes to policing. Going back to what Miss Hattie was just saying, that everything was falling apart when you see the flashing lights behind you because we know the history of police. We all know that there are very good police officers and we know that there's some bad apples in the bunch. But what we also know is that we don't know which one we're gonna end up confronting. We don't know which one is coming into the neighborhood and automatically the, the sirens and the lights go off and we're thinking this guy's coming to kill me. And he may actually just be coming to say, hey man, your tail light's out. Just go ahead and get it fixed. But based on the history of police and based on the history of black people, everybody's radar is up from the police side to the community side. So I just wanted to end that with this. Before police bias can stop, there has to be an internal metamorphosis versus because if there's no internal metamorphosis or a change on the inside, there will never be external manifestation. Bias will never end as long as the police officer in his or her mind thinks, hey, this man is only good to be a criminal. This woman has no virtue. And we're going to continue to underscore the institution of slavery, even though we have no label for it, it still has an impact. So 
I just wanted to talk a little bit about racial profiling, racial bias, and the attitude that police officers have when they come into certain communities. If it's gonna stop, and if it's gonna be better, there has to be more community policing where we're connecting with the community in a more proactive approach than actually coming to the community to confront them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That means you have to like them though, right? Yes. <laughs> There's like, the rub. There's the rub. There's the rub. And initially, police officers usually live or used to live in their communities. Because what we yeah. are experiencing, we have police officers that are coming from a different county mm -hmm. to police us. And then once the job is done, they go back to their homes. Mm -hmm. So if that's going to change, there has to be more connectivity. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope you use that. It sounds like you're on the way to using that PhD very wisely. I'm definitely uh, and, and I, I appreciate it. I appreciate yes, it. Uh, the next speaker is, um, is uh, uh, Lita Heron. Uh, Lita is a community activist in Los Angeles and very happy to have you. Lita, are you there? Lita. We might have to unmute her. Let me okay. Let me okay. find her. Let's see. Let Welcome me... to the world of distance uh, education, folks. Can you hear? <laughs> yes. Lita, there you, you there? <laughs> yes, I am. Can you Thank hear you, me? Thank you, honey. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have about seven or eight minutes, Lita, and we're, we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, as long as you can hear me, then I'm yes. free to start. Okay. And I just want to say that unlike and, and I'm really honored to be a part of this dialogue. Uh, but my position is completely different from anybody else has spoken before me in that I am a street activist. Mm -hmm. That's been the history of my work. And I level with the problems in my community that cross over, uh, that bring us into uh, communication with law enforcement. So it is a part of my history. It's been very uh, troubling. Mm -hmm. It's been very difficult, but we have by necessity been forced to address the major issues affecting uh, my communities in a negative way. And it's taken a few decades to come as far as we have. And I'm sad to say because of George Floyd uh, that today we haven't come far enough. And to just put a pin and timeline, I'm a child of the 60s that lived when Dr. King and Malcolm walk the world and breathe the air that George didn't get. And I got to watch these two men do a phenomena that never been done in the history of this country. And that's to see African Americans march for anything. Mm -hmm. I need people to understand that. That's the magnitude of that movement. That's the first time African Americans stood up collectively and marched for anything. And what motivated it? Two things. Lynching and the murder of 15-year-old Emmett Till and the right to vote. That people were dying and being killed and nobody knew it was because they were trying to register to vote. You see, so when people say things that, you know, why don't you forget that history or move on from it, the sad reality for us is, you know, voting has now become another problem again mm -hmm. as if it never really went away. You see, and so these are the constant challenges that my people face that have impacted us in a, a more negative way than constructive. You know, we're still waiting to be a part of the quilt called America. You see, the thing for others is you came in through Ellis Island, we came in chained at the bottom of a ship. Mm -hmm. You see, we didn't volunteer to come here. We were brought here. So our history is completely different from anyone else other than the original Americans. Now, as a street soldier and a father who was a builder and a grandfather that was a free man because his father was a slave. You see, we have that history in our family, our family. 
And to go through all of that history, to come up from change, to try to work in the rebuilding, to move in the lynching, burning crosses, burning our homes down, killing the fathers in those homes is a history. And I don't know how we forget that when George Floyd was killed the way he was last week with callousness, inhumanity, lack of protection by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. How many times have we been here? And I'm sad to say, I had to say that to somebody this week. How many times have we been here, America? How many more times before we get it right? See, because I don't know how much more we can take as a people. See, and people say, well, why do the kids run? Why do they run? Why do they run? Because they expect that police officer is going to kill them. The sad reality is more often they've been right. Mm -hmm. And as a street soldier, I just want to add in some personal information that in 2007, Los Angeles, a young man, Stephen Eugene Washington, 27 years old and autistic, as an adult struggling to live with his challenges, was murdered by two LAPD officers hiding in their car and shooting at this unarmed man because they heard a noise. He's a man not living in my neighborhood, but somebody else's neighborhood. So he became the immediate visible target. Oh, it must have been him. He's guilty of doing something wrong. And because of his condition, he didn't respond the way they thought he should. Mm -hmm. So they murdered him. Mm -hmm. They murdered him. And they tried to cover it up until it came out that he was autistic. Okay, and sadly for LAPD, Stephen's not the first autistic man that was murdered, okay, and covered up. They fired an officer for doing that and planting a knife on the victim. You see, so we've had a history with the department that's been devastating and confrontational. I mean, from the 65, which I survived that riot too, and what was that about? the police chokehold killing African-Americans with a chokehold. It was a very popular move. You want to know what happened to your son? Well, the police choked him till he died. You see, so that's what the substance of 65 was. Then we come to 92 and the Rodney King beating that, you know, thank goodness there was video. Mm. We'd have never known that Rodney was uh-huh. beaten like that had that man not videotaped it. You see, so that video has really, really become the voice in our silence, the witness, the witness. You see, and it's been a long time coming when you think about all the other things we've never seen. Now, I'm going to jump forward to... I'm not even sure the the year, but Ezel Ford. Ezel Ford, another young man murdered by law enforcement. And the sad reality on my level, we're trying to get the young men to stop killing each other. And then we have the police doing this kind of murder and trying to deny. See, they knew. The thing about Diesel is the, the, the station that killed him knew him. They knew that he had challenges, everything from uh, Tourette's, Tourette's. Huh. Diesel suffered from Tourette's, uh-huh. uh, getting lost. That station used to bring Diesel home because he'd get disoriented and lost. So they knew him. The lead officer in his killing had already arrested Ezell years before for smoking weed in the van with people in the neighborhood. You see, so these are the conditions that black Americans in Los Angeles have had to live under virtually since 92, absolutely for sure. And I will put a pin in this. There used to be a time in those years when they used to, uh, Rodney King was exposure, what was common in my neighborhood. 
Rodney King wasn't a member of my community. He was somebody coming through visiting people down here, and that's what happened to him on his way home. You see, and so down here, it's been a tradition to pick men up that are suspect, take them in the alley and beat them, shoot their dog, kill their dog, take them over the enemy's territory, take their shoes, and leave them there. Okay, and when I ask somebody after respected lead officers, respected, High-ranking officer passed away, and his replacement was at his memorial, and he was in tears, okay? Not of my people, not from my community, but he was in tears. And so that's how we built communication, right there, right there. They had worked together, black and white officers, working the nightmares of my neighborhood, and, and, and my friend was teaching him what it meant to be a real uh, outstanding service to the people, okay? And so I asked him, I asked him very honestly, I looked him in his eyes and I said, you know, it used to be a time when you guys was doing Rodney Kings all over my neighborhood. And he looked at me, he said, you know, that's true, but we don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. That's true, but we don't do it anymore. So now, as the previous guest talked about trauma, add the trauma of those years on a community that's Mm -hmm. been suffering because of them, Mm -hmm. and now you have today. Mm -hmm. You see? And so the explosions, the fires, as somebody pointed out, the fires are the history of cross-burning. We learned it from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fires. Mm -hmm. The rage is the outrage of the voiceless. Mm -hmm. So you have broken windows. Mm -hmm. I can't explain the looting, and I'm not going to try, because in every instance, there have been opportunists and infiltrators that have instigated and taken advantage of our grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't condone looting. I don't condone the window burning. I mean, the burnings or the window breaking. I just understand it. Mm -hmm. And right now, this country is at a defining moment, as I heard somebody else say. We've had the virus. We've had the quarantine. We've had the fear and the job losses. Now we're facing a major break in police conduct. I think the country's at the brink where we're going to change this or... uh, uh, we can kiss ourselves goodbye, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. really. And as an old soldier that's been through too many deaths, believe me, I've had enough. I'm tired of watching our children like Tamir Rice killed. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. That little 12-year-old not knowing any better, playing with his little toy gun in the park. And that and a baby didn't face. Give him a he looked like he was about eight years old mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of twelve. Uh, Lita, we're going to have to stop you right now, but we so appreciate yeah, your ahead. comments, and and we're going to come back, and you know, hopefully, we'll have a little time to have a general discussion. But we need to get Look, our students. It's okay because I didn't think I was going to talk for ten minutes, so that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did right. it. You did it. Thank you so much for uh, for participating. We have a couple. Well, of I used to have a radio show, so I'm not oh, an experienced. I can I can, I can hear that show. voice. Absolutely, it's yeah. a radio voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So is Cameron around? Cameron Pyant? Yes, I'm Are here. You there, Cameron? Yes, oh, I'm here. Fantastic. So uh, please uh, take a few minutes to let us know your perspective on on this. Okay. Firstly, uh, yeah, sorry I'm late. Uh, I was helping around with a lot of different things. You guys know it's a lot of crazy things going on right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Firstly, I'd just like to piggyback on the last person I was talking. I'm sorry, I missed her name. Um, but we really do need to understand that generations after generations, we are fighting this. Um, and that's exactly just how she's fed up. I'm fed up, and I'm only 22 years old. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Because when I go out there and I see my younger generation, I'm seeing seven-year-olds, I'm seeing six-year-olds, I'm seeing them hold signs up mm-hmm. saying that we want justice and we want peace. They don't even know what that is yet. You feel me? Because we, we really have to understand that this world isn't working for us, that this world is 
is not upholding its, uh, its law-abiding citizens, its model citizens accountable for the laws that they, they aren't, um, uh, th that they're acting like they're following. They're not following these laws. Like, what, like this stuff is getting so crazy, y'all. I'm a 22-year-old man, and right now what I am trying to do is decode the Constitution so that we can understand it better. So right now, I just want you guys to understand, this first sentence within the Constitution, it says, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. Right now, there is nothing but people in this world who are facing injustices, facing racial injustices, facing injustices from the police because they are acting like they are the ones following the laws when they're not. Mm -hmm. um, it says that it will also ensure domestic tranquility. Domestic means the people that are within. We are the people that are within this nation. And that if it says that it will ensure us tranquility, why exactly do black people, Mexican people, Arabic people, people who are also American citizens feel no, feel no calmness. Mm -hmm. We don't feel no tranquility within this. And it's like, that's what we're trying to get across to everybody. These, these, this constitution that was ratified in 17, what, 1788 or whenever it was ratified, I believe that that's, uh, that's when it was ratified. That was in the middle of slavery though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. Mm -hmm. And it can't uphold exactly what it means for American people, all American people, if 2020 now, if it's 2020 now, and we've been fighting the same fight this whole time. So it's like, how do we express to people that are acting like they don't get it, that this constitution is only for 1% of the people. It is only for people who are, they say law abiding citizen, but I really feel like it's for racist white Americans. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Cameron. Appreciate it. Yeah, really no appreciate it. It's, it's so good to get uh, a 22 year old's perspective because I'm going to guess nobody else on this panel is 22 years old. So, <laughs> Sid, you are not 22 years old. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. We appreciate that. Uh, yeah, and our, our next student speaker is, is Marlo Brooks. Marlo, are you there? Yes, Marlo here. Hi, Marlo. Hey, Dr. Texera. And um, thank you again for an awesome panel. I'm honored to be here um, among such prestige. Um, many of my professors and uh, people I looked up to in mentorship um, so I'm honored to be here. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am Marlo Brooks. I'm a senior here at Cal State San Bernardino, um, studying English in the College of Arts and Letters. And um, just what we're facing here today, um, honestly, is just, it's not new to us. Um, it's just reached that boiling point. You know, um, I recently ran for um, city council in San Bernardino. Um, earlier um, this year um, in the primary elections. And the reason I consider running, never been a politician, never studied politics, never saw myself in that, in that, in that manner. And, uh, but we were, a, and, and Pastor Lowe said it best earlier, it's, it's, it, we're, at a, we're at a standstill. We're, 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 we can't afford to sleep on the job anymore. And, you know, when I look back at, at our historical leaders and, you know, they were serving in their 20s, serving in their 20s, changing national climates, you know, speaking for us all. And we have to echo that and respond to that in a way where our history isn't forgotten and the injustice doesn't go on any longer. Um, the time is now. We have to start serving. And we, we, we you know, uh, in a time where we don't see hope, we have to believe that hope is still alive, you know, and and not only hope, but it's time to be active amongst each other. And when I say active, you don't have to go out here and be a political leader or an activist. But when I say um, active, you know, I mean, within your own family, you know, raising your, your or showing your, your younger siblings or, or cousins or, or friends and peers, you know, the rights and wrongs and, and, and what we can do to ratify the situation. Um, as a country now, it's, it's time to, we have to heal and we have to move forward, but we have to move forward correctly. What comes next, you know, it's going to be detrimental to our history and, and how our people will persevere in this time. So uh, I'm just honored to be here. Um, I'll, I'll be here doing Q&A as well, but I just wanted to give you a little of my um, experience and, 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 and how I feel in the situation. Great. Thank you so much, Marlo. Um, we appreciate, appreciate your remarks. Um, and, you know, we, 
just want to uh, hope, hopefully we are getting through some of this trauma that we're all experiencing by discussing, you know, they always tell you that you have to talk about it. You have to talk about it. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's what Charlie was, um, was, was hoping uh, that her students would get from this as well as um, the rest of the campus. And, you know, just for you all, um, your, your information, um, we've had close to 400 and some 450 uh, um, participants, uh, and now we're down to 403. So, you know, we, we do appreciate your showing up for this. Um, my, the, the last person on the agenda is moi, and because uh, I am a teacher, I have PowerPoint because that's just the way I roll. So this is, uh, the, and, and what I will, what I'm talking about <clears throat> right now are how we, how we can fix this. And I know several of you have, uh, have actually uh, given uh, your perspective on how we fix this from the, the micro as well as the macro uh, levels. And so I, I would like to just focus on the criminal justice system and, and how, um, you know, because I, I have lived through this as, as some of you, I know, Charlie, you have, you know, the, the Watts riots of 65, 92, and now, now, and, and, um, and, and they always put together panels, always putting together, uh, you know, let's, let's study this, let's study this. This is not brain surgery, folks. We know how to fix this. We know how to fix this. But is the will there? I don't know. So what my, one of my first recommendations is, is the, demilitar, the demilitarization of the police. Uh, many of you young people don't realize that the cops have not always been, you know, come into our neighborhoods all tricked out, you know, with the tanks and the, the body armor and the, the, the amazing weaponry. Uh, a lot of that comes from the federal government. So the federal government is, is, is fueling all of this. And I do want to recommend a book that is recently out um, by uh, a, uh, a journalist by the name of Balco, he, uh, and it's called The Rise of the Warrior Cop. We, we, are, not, we are not a, a foreign country. You know, cops are, are um, supposed to be protecting and serving its citizens, its fellow citizens. So we, uh, we should not have tanks rolling in our streets. Uh, on a regular basis. We should not have kids uh, having, you know, guns uh, at their heads uh, at eight, nine, and 10 years old. Uh, but that's, in fact, what we do have. And, uh, and I think one of the ways, uh, someone said to me the other day, if you have, uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Mm -hmm. So you got, you got all those, that weaponry, you, got, you want to use that weaponry. You know, whether you could be the most, uh, the most sane, uh, rational person in the world, but you're anxious to use that weaponry. And in fact, in fact that's exactly what we're seeing among uh, modern policing. And I just want to quickly go through these. Uh, Pre-employment testing. Um, did you all know that we, as a, in general, do not test cops for bias? We, we test them for uh, drug use, we, trust, we, we test them for former crimes, domestic violence, which is a good thing, but we don't test them for bias. And there are, there are uh, many of you know this, but there are instruments all over the place uh, where, and it would be free, so it wouldn't cost the department anything. Uh, for example, the Harvard uh, uh, Implicit Bias Test uh, where they can suss out all of these folks who are, uh, who are um, going in with a John Wayne mentality and who are, you know, who just want to, as they say, hook and book. So, you know, that, that could be certainly something. And for those of you activists who are going out and talking to your legislators, uh, this might be uh, a, a way to, um, you know, this might be a start. This might be a start. Uh, there should be residency requirements. Uh, I read the other day that over 90% of the police officers in Minneapolis do not live in the city, as someone, uh, one of the, the other panelists so eloquently put it. Uh, you know, they, uh, they you have, in fact, an invading army because, you know, with the, with the, the military gear and everything, they are indeed a, an invading army. 
who don't like the residents, who don't have a stake in the neighborhoods, and I'm generalizing here because that, that just happens to be the case, uh, don't have a stake in the neighborhood. And, uh, and so they come in, uh, make their money, and they take their money out to their communities in Orange County or in um, uh, West, uh, the, the, the West LA County, and, uh, and, and neighborhoods are left uh, in no better shape, and in fact, maybe worse shape than than they uh, previously were. Uh, change the goals, thus you change the culture. What is the goal of policing? Is it to protect and serve? Or, or is it to, um, to harass, uh, to put kids on gang lists that um, have never even been in a gang? Uh, uh, what, just what is the goal? And, uh, and so there has to be a, a deep, deep conversation of how, you know, what, what we're going to do. By the way, don't get fooled with the, the kneeling police. Do not Mitch. get fooled with the kneeling police because that's a PR thing. I can guarantee you that's a PR thing. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, drug decriminalization. Uh, a lot of folks are, you know, oh, I can't, we can't decriminalize. Well, we decriminalize marijuana, right? And it was a class three drug. It was considered a class three drug. So, you know, why not decriminalize and let the, um, the medical profession take care of uh, drugs and drug users? Uh, protect whistleblowers. Um, a, lot of, a lot of cops um, do, do not want to uh, inform on their, on their fellow cops. I want to remind you that uh, the Rodney King beating, um, there were four who were actively involved in beating Rodney King, but there were also 20 cops standing around watching, 20. And you will never guess how many reported the incident. Two, an uh, Africa, uh, African-American male and a, a white woman re reported it to their supervisors. And if it had not been for that video, we would not have known because we know what reporting can do, but, but there, there's retaliation. There's lots of retaliation for police officers. And, and when we talk about retaliate, we're talking about retaliating people who have guns and who have weaponry. So I think that uh, that's a, another way that we can ensure that, uh, that the bad cops will be weeded out. Um, and the, the other thing is to form civilian re review boards with real power of oversight. Uh, after the Rodney King uh, incident, there, there was an attempt, and I think LA probably still has a civilian review board, but it's in name only. Uh, they don't have any real power. But how are you, if my son committed a crime, are you going to let me adjudicate that crime? No, you're going to take him to a police, right? You're going to take him to law enforcement. We cannot have uh, these bad police officers being judged by their own departments. That does not make any sense. There is no other, uh, no other entity in the United States where people are in judgment of themselves. You just, it, it, we just can't have that. To me, that makes sense. That makes sense. And finally, uh, no taxpayer money for court settlements. The, these, um, this should come out of the police union because they're always, the police union is always, um, uh, they are defending these police officers, so let them pay for it too. But our tax money, uh, millions and millions of dollars every single year uh, is used to pay for cops like, like the man who killed um, uh, uh, George Floyd. Uh, millions and millions of dollars. And uh, is that fair? Taxpayers, black, white, uh, Latino, Asian, Native American should be outraged that our tax money, when you know we, you look at our schools, that money could be going to schools or to fix streets or whatever, uh, and so not, no tax money for court settlements. And I think with that, I am going to stop and open it up. Um, Jeremy, uh, do we have questions from our um, uh, from our audience? Um, thank you all so much for for participating. Uh, Jeremy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Do we have any questions that we want to uh, present to we our have panelists? A few. If folks okay. want to get back in with the okay. questions, um, I forwarded a few of them, but since then, my, my, I'm sorry, my internet went out, and I, so I lost the chat. Oh no. Oh. Some folks had sent some students some questions. 
So um, you can raise your hand and be manually unmuted. We have about seven or eight hosts here who can unmute you. So, um, uh, yes, I see. I think uh, Aklam had a question. Um, let Hi, me see. Um, let me see. Okay, actually, she's in. Uh, I'm going to find her very quickly here. Okay, Aklam, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, please. Can you hear us? Are you muted, Alam? Uh, uh, yes, now. I, I, Sorry. It, it took two steps, I guess. Sorry, I appear as Mahmoud Zubaydi. I, yeah. I logged in from my husband's account. I apologize. Uh, thank you so much uh, for organizing. This is, this is amazing. And these are voices we needed to hear. Um, and I'm so happy it's led by Black voices. This is very important that they lead the way and show us what we need to do uh, in order to uh, demand racial justice in this country. Um, I have, um, I guess, two questions um, or someone else for Dr. Texiera, sorry. And that's, um, there is now a very serious call to depolicing campuses. I mean, you know, to dismantling the police force, at least in its, its structural form, you know, um, and what it stands for and its connection to the institution of slavery. But as a campus, you know, in academia, there is actually a very serious call by like California's cause of, for academic freedom, for example, now we are discussing this very seriously and other, you know, institutions to de-police campuses uh, to, to, to stop the links, you know, with the police until there is serious reform at least. Uh, so what, what do you, how do you see that? How, how, how would you comment on this uh, movement now? Um, and the other one, I guess, is since you mentioned, uh, Dr. Tixier again, the um, marching into neighborhoods, you know, fully armed like a military, if you could comment on the link between the militarization of police and the training of almost all of our police uh, departments in the United States at the hands of Israeli uh, military forces. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, they, they do. Um take their training, many police office, uh, police departments around the country take their training from uh, the military yeah. forces in, uh, in Israel. That's a really good point, Alam. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing is, uh, I, I, you all don't, maybe don't have the history, but um, we didn't always have campus police. We call them campus safety officers. They were not armed. They did not have the weaponry that uh, that we see among our police officers now, and you know the the, the most we, we do have serious crime sometimes serious crime on campus, but I don't think that that a, a university is a good environment to have police officers. Uh, we used to have uh, black fraternity and sorority dances on campus, and uh, years ago, and we found out that um, that. The, all of the participants in these dances uh, and parties were being surveilled by our campus police, you know, who had cameras set up on the, the highest building on campus and they were surveilling um, the, the young black uh, fraternity and sororities on campus. So uh, it's, it, it can, no, no good can come of it. So I think, I think, and maybe someone else has an opinion about this, but, uh, but I, I do believe that we should demilitarize um, the, the uh, campus police. We should, de we should disarm campus police, and we should stop sending our forces, our police officers over to Israel to, uh, to get training because we know what, how that turns out. Because um, we see in Palestine today uh, you know, the parallels, there's so many parallels. White supremacy works the same all over the world, folks. It works the same all over the world. And the police are in the front lines of that, of enforcing white supremacy. So, uh, yeah, yes, on both, on both counts, Alam. Any yeah, other, any, anyone else want to come in? I, I am going to post uh, questions as they come up in the chat. Okay. Okay. And the next question is from Marmar Zacher. And I'm going to unmute Marmar now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I live in Los Angeles County, so I'm more of aware of what's going on in Los Angeles. 
And last night they arrested over almost 300 people on Hollywood and Fifth Street. And I've been when watching everything going on in other cities and other countries and just the entire militarization of the entire country, especially in DC and in the East Coast. And I'm really wondering what type of era do you think we're moving on? What type of movement are we moving on? Because I've never seen anything like this in America. Like I've seen it before in the Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution, but um, this is the first time I've ever seen anything in America. So I just really want to know what type of movement are we moving towards? What's happening? Okay. Anyone uh, else like that? Please. Hello. Can I answer that one? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, I believe the movement that we are looking forward to actually implement, because there is a lot of rioting going on, there are a lot of looters going on, there, there's a lot of looting going on, and those are the people who are outraged, and you can't blame them for being outraged. There are American people who are also American citizens mm -hmm. that are being killed unjustly simply because racial discrimination and the color of their skin. So they have a right to be outraged. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the fact that they should be out there, you know, destroying things because these are still our buildings. These are still our cities that we have to live within. But I can't be mad at the fact that they're outraged because I know why they're, I know why they're mad. And um, what we're only, we're not only fighting police brutality. This isn't just because uh, George Floyd was killed and murdered. That, that, that's what, like, that's what got us fed up. But the thing is, we're, we're fighting police brutality right now. We're fighting oppression right now. We're fighting racial discrimination. We're fighting the injustices against people of color. We're fighting all that right now. And it's, it's at a height. It is right now to where it's a world issue. And I feel this is the perfect time to where we don't let it cease this time. We won't allow it to just be brushed under the rug and, until another mm -hmm. cop kills mm -hmm. another uh, person mm -hmm. just because of the color of his skin, just because he... Um, feels a certain way about him because of his self and because of his beliefs when as American people we should all have you know equal opportunity and equal beliefs in, in terms of who, who that person is and the color of their skin I shouldn't I shouldn't have hatred towards them because of that and the police um, also saw another question talking about will the police actually be able to be reformed there is no way it can't not be reformed because in terms of these laws these laws come up and right now we're saying that within our own constitution it is not uh, it is not upholding what it stands for like there are people whose liberties are being taken away there are people who where where posterity is being taken away so the fact that all that stuff is not within uh not for all of its american people is it's it's, a, it's time for a change if it was ratified in 1788 at, during the middle of slavery why not in 2020 will we be able to come together as a collective unit as united american people into changing it and why are people so against changing it, and, is, and, and that's when we really have to think, even though most of us don't have to think, they're so caught up in not changing it because of white supremacy, because they know that if they go into change these issues, that no, no, superiority will, no superiority will exist anymore, that everything will actually be equal, that they will be held accountable if they do anything criminal. In terms of policing, right now it seems like policing is strictly off of demographics. That's how they figure out exactly how dangerous something is. Like, oh, is it a black person? Okay, it might be dangerous. Somebody can call the police on a black man and say he's out there loitering right now. And then they'll call the police on him. The police will come with their guns on their hands, mm -hmm. with their gun already in their hand, uh, with their hand already on their guns and stuff like that. So being that that is, we're being policed by our demographics. We're not even being policed by our criminal, our criminal activity anymore within this whole world. Because if that's the case, then there will be more criminals that are being uh, incarcerated, more criminals that are being killed and not innocent people. Mm -hmm. And do you think that whites know that when they, um, when they call on you know, a, a, a potential crime or crime being committed, if they say the person is black, will the cops get there faster? <laughs> um, we, we could just think about what just recently happened. I, I believe it was after George Floyd, um, a white woman called Mm -hmm. the police on a black man because her dog was off the leash. She mm -hmm. wasn't holding her dog on a leash. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm going to call the police on you now. If the police come and and they and she tells them that, oh, it's a black man that's harassing her, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. bothering her, the first thing that they're going to do, because for some reason, we provoke fear just because of the color of our skin. They're going to come with their guns already drawn. And being that we've been fighting this for so long, whenever we do ever get into a place where we have to stand right in front of the police. That's why right now you guys have got to understand people who are black, people who are out there fighting for us that are allied with us, 
the, we, we are at war right now. It is a fight for our lives. And you really have to understand that because we're all trying to figure out why this hasn't been changed and we've been fighting it all for so long. Think, really think about this right now. There are so many people within your family that have so many different generational intersectionalities, but they're all fighting the same fight right now against oppression, against racial discrimination, and against white supremacy. So there shouldn't be anybody that's against stopping that. If you want equal opportunity, you want somebody to, you want somebody to be raised in this earth with a, with a chance to actually have a kind heart, with a chance to actually go into the world and actually know that they can be free and that they can actually figure out things off of, off of just the, the assets and what, 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 is out, what is out there in the world that it has to, uh, to offer and what it has to give. That's when everything is equal. When a person can go out there, when a black person can go out there and people don't look at him like, oh, he comes from the hood. Or people don't look at him like, oh yeah, he's un he's unintelligent or anything like that, or he doesn't know how to uphold himself in pos in, in settings to where it's um, professional. Now, me, I have been in all different spectrums of conversations. I have been in in, in uh, conversations to where it's there's not a, a height of professionalism within the conversation. We are only talking about the things that are hurting us. We are only talking about the things that are within the hood, the things that nobody else sees. But then I've also been into conversations to where I've spoken to, you know, presidents, I've, I've spoken to administrators, I've, told, uh, I've spoken to advisors, and it's like, like, why does it, why does one person have to be like, oh, well, he made it out, he's a different type of black person. No, oh, I'm, I'm still black, they're still black. We just all haven't been given the same opportunities, and we just all don't strive for the same opportunities because this world is so evil, and this world is also trying to stop different people from actually going to strive for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Can I answer Cam on that too? Or piggyback off what Cam was saying? Um, there was a, I actually wrote some lyrics um, that dealt with the relationship between uh, the police and the community. And it goes back to what I was saying as far as bias. Now, some of the same people who quote Bible, if you will, um, particularly when you get into chapter one, verse 26, um, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. When a police officer comes into the community, what is he seeing? I said, what's he thinking when he brands his Glock? Is he thinking the image of God or a hoodlum on the block? So if he's coming in there with the mindset that I'm better than this person, I have a bias because he's black and he's coming from a certain neighborhood, I'm already coming in there with the idea to confront, not to connect. So when I look at that, <laughs> the systemic racism that we're um, experiencing here is based on the fact that we're already considered less human. And I believe that, and a lot of people argue against this, but I believe that Charles Darwin's uh, Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest, I think that made people comfortable with hatred. Mm -hmm. Because now they can, uh, they can assign yeah. it to a different pigmentation when all of us have the same pigment, it's just that one has a higher dosage than the other. So I think when he brought it in under scientific guise, it made people who already hate it um, justified in their hatred. So when they see us, they're already in their mind's eye thinking, I'm better than you. And when you look at Derek Chauvin, and what he did, that was clear in his face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I'd like to speak to that as well. Because, because what happens is, even when, when there, there's rioters and, and looting, as a black leader, especially a pastor, there's no space where I can condemn violence. Right. But, but the reality is our nation was founded on a riot. <laughs> you know, in 1774, some, oh, yeah. some white oppressed settlers yeah. had enough of their oppression from the King of England. So they stormed the Boston Harbor, mm -hmm. attacked the ships, did what would be in today's dollar 1.7 million dollars in damage. The King of England called it a riot, right? Then he declared war, and 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 then we the Revolutionary War began. But yet, when we read it in our history books, they call it a party, the Boston mm -hmm. Tea, party. Tea Party. That yeah. was a riot. Yes, so then now we feel the pressure to say, okay, I got to make sure that it doesn't look like this. So yeah. so so throughout American history, violence has been the way. That, that American Americans have achieved its goals and dreams. So mm -hmm. what am I saying? I'm not saying I'm condemning violence, but, but, but why are they different? 
Mm-hmm. Now, this mm-hmm. is what I would say to everybody on this call. And I really want to say this to Marlo and, and, and the college students on this call, Cameron. This is very important. The first murder in the Bible is, is Genesis chapter four, where, where Cain murders his brother Abel. Mm-hmm. And God shows up and speaks to, to Cain. And he says, what have you done? And, and, and Cain tried to act like he didn't do anything wrong because he tried to cover up what he had done. And God said this, Cain, Abel's blood has cried out to me from the ground. Mm-hmm. American soil is soaked yep. with the blood of the African-American person. And that blood- And, and let's not forget Native Americans on, Native the, Ameri- on whose land we sit right now. Right. <laughs> and, and people of color. Yes. And, and yes. people of color. And, and we-, we, we and my point is, Cain's punishment is that he would be banished from the land. Mm-hmm. And this is a very spiritual thing that is happening in our country. And so all the young people on this call, as you go to college, as you educate yourself, you are positioning yourself to lead the land that your oppressors are about to be banished from. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that again. As you go and you get your education and you get your PhD and you get your master's degree, you are positioning yourself to lead what your oppressors will be banished from. And and, and to the police thing, this is very important. As I lead, there are three types of authority I have seen. Spiritual authority, positional authority, and relational authority. What made uh, Martin Luther King so effective is that he had all three. Police are operating in only positional authority. And every single person who only uses positional authority, no spiritual authority, no relational authority, they're not in their communities, they don't have relationship. It is a matter of time before you abuse that power. So we absolutely need to demilitarize, but we need police living in the communities, being on the ground, and and, and this is very important. And the last thing that that I will say, this is really important um, to know, is that we have to come, we have to tear the foundations of our nation apart. Our foundation was built on oppression. And so when all those white settlers signed the Declaration of Independence, the reality is it was their slaves that passed them the pen. So until we address them, until people admit it, we're not going to see it. And I get back to the prophetic future. Because a lot of times when this happens again and again and again, let me tell you something, you mark my words, this one is not the same thing. You, you're right. You, it yep. is not the same mm-hmm. thing. There has mm-hmm. never been a unified cry through social media mm-hmm. and technology that we are seeing. I have white pastors who haven't said a word, promoted Trump on all their platforms, shutting down their social media, calling black people for help. And, and, and while they may be doing that for the wrong reasons, listen, they're still doing that. What is that? The transfer of authority is coming. Now you are considered an oppressor if you don't speak up for Black people. When has that happened in mm-hmm. American mm-hmm. history? Mm-hmm. And the last thing I will say to this is we have to be careful that we don't talk so much about racism that someone asks themselves the question, am I racist? Because in my spaces that I go in the church, I know a lot of people that aren't racist, but they are environmentalists and they're creating environments that racism can thrive. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, not just am I racist, but do I create environments where racism can thrive? Mm -hmm. We integrated our schools, we integrated our churches, but white kids have still have no black friends, no black community, and they grow up to be racist and oppressors. And so mm-hmm. I just wanted to say that to the students, stay educated, keep doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And I honestly believe that you will be our, our leaders mm-hmm. in the future. Sure. And, and just to underscore what you just said, you know, people think, oh, I got my degree. I'm never going to open up another book. But you got to keep studying. Yes. You got to keep studying your entire life. Keep studying. Keep, keep uh, uh, arming, arming, to use, you know, that horrible metaphor. But arm yourself with the truth so that nobody can can shut you down once you know the truth. Uh, Marlo, did you have something to say about this? Um, yes, and um, 100% correct. Um, as a student, um, I, often sign, I oftentimes find myself 
being able to play both sides, a student and the servant of the community as well. Um, so, so living in that um, and waking up in those shoes every day, uh, being able to learn as well as project that energy into the community and to, into my peers. And um, it's just a, um, a privilege that I have on my own, but I couldn't do it without mentorship. That's one, one, um, one standard or, or, or one thing that's almost forgotten in our communities um, is to to be able to provide that mentorship to each other uh, to follow that path. So um, to to the people that mentor me daily and, and call and check on me to make sure my mental health is in, in check as well, we have to do that amongst each other. Um, these are times where, like, um, and, and one of our participants and one of our panelists said it earlier, uh, when we're, we're facing PTSD and may not even know it. Um, we have to check on each other, we have to be there. And if one thing COVID-19 taught us is to be there for each other, uh, we're not in this alone. So um, continue to cover each other, continue to uh, protect, but um, be aware at all times. Thank you. Um, and and I, I meant to, to mention it with uh, Hattie, uh, she calls it PTSD, but there's a very prominent uh, psychologist, Joy DeBry, who calls it post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I think that really captures for me, and she gives, uh, you know, we can't afford her on campus, but she gives these wonderful talks all around the country. Uh, but that really captures it for me because it's, it's almost genetic the way, um, you know, we have lived this trauma for, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 generations. And, uh, and, and unless we start um, understanding and caring for each other and self-care, uh, it's going to just, we're going to pass it on to the next generation. So uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate your remarks. Mark, did you have something to add? Oh, Mark. No? Okay. <laughs> Mary, can I just flag that there's a couple Absolutely. Questions? Absolutely, Jeremy. Go ahead. I've collected a few questions in the chat. Um, okay. and, and we also have, um, oh, looks like we just lost Bill. Uh, uh, Bill Dixon had his hand raised. Okay. Um, and then Ginger Hartman had her hand raised. Okay, can I just say that, that uh, Lisa Bartle from the library um, uh, just wrote and said that The Rise of the Warrior Cop, uh, the book that just came out, which is amazing, it's available in our library in ebook form. So if anyone would like to read that, um, my students over the weekend, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so do we have a question? No. Uh, yes, I think. Um, okay. Ginger, can you? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm here. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm so grateful that you guys did this. I am a white person, but I, I want this change to happen. But what can I do as a white person to help support this movement and to make sure that, you know, I, I'm always conscious of trying to say the right things or not be mm -hmm. offensive in any way. Or, you know, some people say, you know, you don't see color and they never say you have to see color. And I am, I'm a little bit confused on the best way to do that and and not to offend anybody but to help this movement and help it to everybody to change the narrative and realize the importance and the significance of this um so i i hope that i can get some feedback on on the best things that i can be doing absolutely may i answer that yeah absolutely and then can we get charlie in also to to answer Oh, she can ask before me, actually. Do you feel comfortable answering that, Charlie? Y yes, but I just was answering a student, so tell me again. Oh. Oh, what uh, Ginger what, wanted what, to know what she could do. What can white people do? Yeah, what, what can, can white, white people, people do? do? Right, well, right. Cameron, we'll, we'll get back to you. Don't, don't go away. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I did hear that, because one of the students asked what book you were recommending, Mary, and I, I was just going to tell my students that are still here, and I know some are, I'll post that book for you, so don't worry about it. Okay. Um, I'll make sure you know, but I think as as white people, you you've got to be allies. But but the idea of the color blindness is just, uh, you know, imp, it, the imp, implicit idea there is there's something wrong with color, which is ridiculous. So I think we have to you know, learn to celebrate and get rid of the idea that all we're going to do is tolerate. Uh, and, and instead of just tolerating each other, we're going to celebrate our differences, which are primarily cultural. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not biological. Race is a social construct. So um, 
So Ginger, there, what you're doing, like attending these kinds of panels, mm -hmm. is a very good thing. And this is how you, you know, I tell my students, they know that I, my feeling is if you were educated in America and you're white, you're racist. You know, it, it's only a matter of degree. I battle every single day and I have biracial kids and teach it for a living and I battle it every day. I'm trying to unlearn what they taught me back in elementary school in the 50s. So, you know, we all have those battles and the thing is, face it, admit it, you know, we, we got to unlearn this stuff, you know, it's inculcated deeply. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's systemic inculcation. That's what I would call it. You know, so we just, that's what we're up against. That's what, that's what we've got to battle. Great. And I think also the fear factor. you got to remove the fear factor. The media likes to paint the picture. Yes. That the black man is this boogeyman. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. That the black man is violent and he's right. this, that, and the other. And when you hear this kind of rhetoric, what ends up happening, you'll get into an elevator and someone's in the elevator already. They're grabbing their purse. They're moving closer to the edge of the elevator because they think, me being in there, I'm going to steal something from you. Mm -hmm. we, we've seen this story play out time and time again, even to the point where someone did that to Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley as they entered into the elevator. Why are you grabbing your purse? They're not going to hurt you. So when we get this fear thing, uh, well, black people are scary and, and perhaps maybe you're scared that we don't just want to be equal, but we're going to get revenge. Mm -hmm. If that's what I can understand why you would be scared, but they've got to get rid of this fear factor the thing. Cause if you, if that continues, it's going to, they'll shoot you just out of being scared. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, you got to get rid of that. Good. Cameron, did you have something to add? Thanks, Sid. Go ahead, Cameron. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I forgot the name of who asked the question, but yeah, her uh, name is Ginger. Her name is Ginger. Ginger, mm -hmm. thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Uh, one thing I would say in terms of all of our allies um, from all different types of ethnicities, all different type of types of intersectionalities, know that Black people appreciate you out there. And right now, like how uh, the other man that was just saying, if you go into an elevator, you know, things would change just because of the narrative the black man has. But if you guys are out there protesting with black people, you guys will see passion. You will see compassion. You will see hatred for the system that we've been fighting for so long. So understand that that is not anger towards you guys. That is not anger towards our allies, but that is anger towards we are still fighting the same fight. Like mm -hmm. earlier when um, the woman said, uh, generations like we generations after generation we've been fighting this understand that me personally right now the way I feel is my degree won't mean, mean anything because all I'm chasing my degree for is to diminish racial discrimination oppression this, this is the only thing I'm I'm trying to get a degree for anyway so I could teach students like myself students that were me um, before they even got to college that they don't have to live within these systems they don't have to feel like they're uh, living uh, a life uh, th that their life is a burden just because of the color that their uh, color of their skin. So when our allies go out there, just um, make sure that you know that you are fighting racial discrimination. You're fighting oppression. You're fighting white supremacy. So they they need to also know that you know exactly what you are fighting. So you know, be more educated on what exactly the fight is. How you can actually. Uh, find ways in order to help these uh, help these people and show them that you are a true ally of what exactly they're fighting. Um, when you see them having the opportunity to where they can get arrested or something like that, tell them that they are forgetting about the fight. And because if they hear that from you, like you're forgetting about the fight because you're about to get arrested and you will actually hurt our numbers when we need to show strength in our unity. So you're actually forgetting about the fight. Let them know that. Like, don't give them a reason to jail you. Don't give them a reason to, you know, don't don't give them a reason to allow them uh, to, to let you get within their grasp. Because once they grab you, once they, once they have a hold of you, they, they could beat you, they could kill you, they could incarcerate you. And that, it, that does nothing but take away from our unity and take away from our numbers. So we just need to express to each other that we all have, we're all fighting the same fight because we all see the same thing. We all see the racial injustices. We all see the oppression. 
we all see that the the constitution isn't upholding itself we all see that the model citizens aren't following the law we all see that the police aren't following the law and that's what you just need to explain to people when you're out there that you actually understand what the fight is about and you're not just out there screaming a person's mm -hmm. name with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Thank you all for those comments. And I hope they help Ginger. But I, I just want to bring up something that uh, really, I think, fa was surprised me that in the midst of apartheid in South Africa, you know, we saw, you know, the conditions in the townships, and we saw, you know, the poverty of the black population, the majority black population in South Africa, most white people never saw that. Most po white people had no idea, kind of, that those kinds of conditions um, uh, existed in those townships in South Africa. And, and I think, you know, when Cameron says, uh, you know, we all see this, all white people do not see this. Some black people do not see this. Some Latino people do not see this. Uh, and so that's what I meant by educating, educating ourselves, whether it's reading or documentaries or newspaper, social media, we need to educate ourselves. And by the way, Ginger, um, I do appreciate that, that you want to learn. So I think you should continue to educate yourself. But I also want to say to black folks that it is not our responsibility to educate white people about this. Uh, white, people ha white people have to educate themselves and go back to their communities and go back to your churches. You know, did, did, what, what, was the, what was the sermon like in your churches and your synagogues and your mosques over the weekend after the killing, after the horrible killing of a, of a, 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 a young black man? What did your churches have to say about that? And if they don't have a, uh, a message of social justice, then, then go on to the next church because that's what Jesus, that's what Muhammad, that's what Buddha, that, that's what they were all about is social justice. So educate yourself, but also educate your community, uh, make some noise in your churches and other institutions. But, and I, and I, do, uh, I do believe, I, I'm so impressed with the young people who do have, still have hope. Um, most of us oldies don't necessarily have as much hope as you do, but we're leaving this world to you. We're leaving this world messed up, unfortunately. I apologize for, for the boomers out there who are leaving this world to you, but I know that uh, feeling your spirit, I know that you can, you can change the world. You can change the world. You, you know how to in, interpret the world. You know how to analyze it, and, and you can do it. Um, I just want to say- Cameron, go ahead. I just want to say that there's no reason to apologize for that because the the generations before us they got us to exactly where we needed to be in order to finish this fight because at first it was only you guys out there at first it was it was only 12 13 people out there all black fighting the same fight but now that we actually have unity from different if different intersectionalities we might be able to you know actually figure out how to solve this because now they have to understand that it is a united American yeah. people. It's not just black people that are fighting this fight. It's everybody that is within America that is actually fighting this. Like, it's, it's, I just don't understand how we see these things and we don't think racial discrimination or we don't think racism still exists because how can a 12 year old boy like Tamir Rice die because of a toy gun? Or how can recently, I believe last night, a 13 year old boy with a gun was shot 17 times because he was black um, at the height of everything that's going on, how can they die like that? They die so so brutally. But when there were white kids who went into schools and they killed multiple people, they went into movie theaters and they killed multiple people. They went into schools like like these are public places, and they're killing people. But yet they get arrested. Yet they're re arrested peacefully. Not only are they arrested peacefully, the, the, I believe the uh, the kid that shot at the the school, they they took him the subway after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, was he, like, shot, he shot up the church. Shot up the church, and yeah, he was taking the subway. Roof. They stopped. They stopped at at um, at Burger King because uh, he said he was hungry. How nice of them, right? Uh, but he's a murderer. But yeah, the kid with the yeah. twelve year old gun. Yeah. What, where's he at? He's laying in the dirt, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like, these, exactly. these are the things that people are trying to block out because of their privilege. But it's like, there is no privilege no more. That's what, this is what I love right now. So to the generations before, from, from myself, like if, if it is the last thing I do, understand that they, 
they they're 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 we have their foot on we have our foot on their necks. They they feel so tense right now. The way the world is right now, to where even police are even doing illegal things in front of a camera, is because mm -hmm. they know that we have their uh, we have our foot on their necks and on this racist system that is set up for us. And we are, we're finally seeing it because we're we're not letting up this time. The fact that we we see all these different things and all these different injustices against us uh, from the people who are supposed to be giving us justice. Understand, this is your last time. This is the last time you will ever feel this superiority. This is the last time you will ever feel any of this because this time the, the, the fight will not cease. This time the fight will actually end with the victory. My people will not cry again because another black person was killed senselessly. This time my people will cry because there was a victory from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very well said, very well said Cameron. Uh, are there any other questions, Jeremy, or? Uh, I only we... want to relay a, a comment that I've gotten a lot of, um, mm -hmm. and that is for Rory, uh, because uh, she's our ASL interpreter, and many people who are experienced in her line of work know that it's not standard for an interpreter to go so long without a break. Aww. Uh, and, uh, really remarkable, actually, and, and, and so I just want to thank Rory. I, I want to thank everybody for joining. We are well over our time. There are still people with hands up. Um, there are uh, a lot of questions that I relayed into the chat and they will be part of the recording. Um, they will accompany the recording uh, and we will have a recording and we'll share it. I, I've said where we would share it, the History Club YouTube page. And we are gonna have more of these events. Um, so that's, that's all I wanna uh, say, except a, a, a really heartfelt thank you on behalf of my students who are joining this class, um, jo joining this, this talk, um, especially to our panelists. Uh, and I won't take any more time enlisting all of them because we assembled a pretty remarkable large group of really, really wonderful people. Uh, so Mary, I'll, I'll turn it over back to you and you can decide um, whether you wanna proceed, whether you wanna address any more questions or hopefully- I wanna stay here all night. I wanna stay here all night. Yeah. <laughs> Not in a rush. No, no, no. We're going to let everybody go because students have classes and other other things to, to deal with um, other than sitting and talking with uh, a bunch of uh, folks. Um, I, I, uh, I just want to thank you so much. I am so privileged to be a part of, of all of this uh, and to continue to, to continue. I, like many of you, I have shed many, many tears in the last couple of weeks many, many tears. My heart is broken, as I'm sure many of yours uh, are. Um, but I think uh, listening to students, listening to the young people has given me hope. I, I feel like I just got a shot of vitamin B12 or something because I'm ready to hit the streets again. Um, but I, I, do, I do want us to, 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 the takeaway here is to make change happen with our legislators, with, um, with our uh, boards of supervisors uh, to, uh, to, to change the system because it's, we're never going to go back to where we were before. We're never going to go back. I feel that very, very strongly in my bones that we're never going to go back. So I hope I'm, I hope I'm right and I hope I see it, you know, I hope I see it soon. Um, does anyone else have any uh, last comments or questions uh well well thanks thank you all I so much I have a go, go ahead camera <laughs> my comment is just i want i want to say that i appreciate everybody that is here um i pray for you guys safety i pray that we do actually see change one day and you know that that's all i have to say i just appreciate you guys from the bottom of my heart for even being you know, willing to even jump into the conversation and actually, yeah. you know, try to figure out things. So that's all I want to say. I appreciate that. For we real. love you, Cameron. We love you. We love you guys too. Let's we love make that, this you're, that you're fighting the good fight. And we, hey, let's we make hope this you change. continue. And let us know what we can do. Let us know what we can do. Uh, Sorry, can so, we recognize Andre Harrington quickly? Um, why? Why do we have to recognize Andre? <laughs> Where's Andre? You're unmuted, Andre. Okay, Dr. Mary. Thank you very much. Uh, you always got the joke, sister. Always got the jokes. That wasn't a joke, Andre. I know, I know. <laughs> this is what I want to leave you all with. Someone asked me exactly the same question. Well, what can I do? What can I do to help? And my response was like my grandmother would have probably said to me. First of all, clean your house. Take out your own trash. Clean out your baggage. Then help your neighbor. 
clean their house and wash down their walls. I'm out. Okay. All right. And and you went back to Virginia on that one, huh? Because you, you you slipped right to. into a southern accent. <laughs> clean out your damn house. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have all been wonderful, wonderful, and I think thank you, Andre, for for closing us out with with those uh, those two pieces of advice. And we'll talk soon, everyone. Take care. Yeah, a quick apology to to the many questions and the and the and the folks who patiently waited. Um, but it it was an enormous event, much larger than we expected. Yeah. But I I hope I can invite some of our panelists back, as well as uh, many other voices. Um, and, and we're going to do this again, uh, I think maybe in a week or so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. We got to strike while the iron is hot, so to speak. So see you all. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Mary.